first of all, I just want to appreciate uh, everybody who's here. I particularly want to uh, appreciate the walkers. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, walkers who carry the message from community to community. Uh, it's at the community level that we begin to transform national policy. Uh, I, I have a memory, you bring back a memory from before my hair was uh, as white and thin as it is, uh, of being the Arizona coordinator for the Continental Walk for Disarmament and Human Needs. I think that was back in 1976. So ancient, ancient history and, and, and memories. Um, I'll say a little bit at the end, as, as Jay said, uh, about uh, what you're going to find when you get to New York and, and who is involved. There's a lot of people. Uh, but my primary task is, uh, um, unfortunately, to be the bearer of unhappy news uh, and give, uh, give some analysis as to where we are and why we are uh, in the situation we're in. And, you know, the challenge there as well is to try to uh, keep it tight. Uh, what, I, what I need to begin to say is that um, when you enter into to thinking about this and to really studying it, uh, what you find is that uh, the U.S. government is, is not what we were told it was uh, when we were uh, raised as children and going through elementary school and, and high school. Uh, you begin to get an understanding of how uh, much of the rest of the world uh, begins to, to uh, conceive the United States. Uh, in relationship to uh, nuclear weapons, uh, uh, it's not a surprise to anybody here that uh, they began with uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, I don't have time to go into why those bombs were dropped in any detail, uh, but to appreciate that Japan was attempting to surrender at that time, had been for about a year. Uh, nearly all of the major uh, U.S. Uh, military leaders, uh, Admiral Leahy, uh, Eisenhower, uh, even Stimson, uh, who was uh, Secretary of War at the time, uh, were quite clear that we didn't, as Eisenhower said, uh, need to use that awful thing. Um, even Curtis LeMay, who was leading the firebombing of all of Japan's major cities, uh, was quite clear that uh, Japan would surrender uh, without an atomic bomb or without Russia's intervention uh, into the war uh, by uh, November of 1945. Um, in terms of what the bomb did, uh, the targeting criteria, and we just need to kind of root ourselves in what nuclear weapons do here for a minute. Uh, the targeting criteria, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, was it needed to be a city with military functions with densely packed workers' homes. Uh, so uh, innocent people were targeted uh, from the beginning. Uh, the, uh, while there were multiple reasons for the bombing, the determinative reason uh, was that they were the first bombs of the Cold War. Uh, the idea was to bring the war to an immediate end uh, before the uh, Soviet Union came into the war uh, on April 15th. Uh, the, the, the fear was that the United States would have to share influence in Asia uh, as it already had to share influence with the Soviets uh, in, in Europe. Uh, see Yalta, for example. Uh, the, the concern was around northern China, Manchuria, Korea, and possibly Japan itself. Let me say a few things about what the, bombs, uh, the, the, the Hiroshima bomb did. Uh, to appreciate that the Hiroshima bomb, which by today's standards is a small bomb, uh, uh, most of the strategic weapons are 20 times more powerful uh, than the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, it had the uh, heat of the sun, 3 million degrees. Uh, its fireball was 750 feet across. Uh, within the first second, uh, everybody within a two-mile radius had been poisoned with radioactive fallout within the first second. Uh, the entire city was destroyed, or within a two-mile radius was destroyed within nine seconds. Um, these, this, I'm going to show you a few pictures here from a um, PowerPoint that was uh, put together by a, actually a Nagasaki uh, A-bomb survivor. Some of these images will be familiar, uh, some not. Um, uh, the Japanese understanding of what, what took place there uh, was quite literally hell. Uh, uh, by the year's end, uh, 100,000 people in Hiroshima had died from a single bomb. And to this day, people continue to die of uh, cancers and other uh, radiation illnesses. Uh, and because radioactivity causes genetic damage, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, though it's not talked much about, uh, deep fears about what it means in second and third generation um, uh, A-bomb survivors. Uh, considerable discrimination against them, especially in terms of marriage, uh, because of fears of the genetic uh, damage. 
Um, this man uh, actually survived and uh, went on to become one of the founders of the organization of, of A-bomb survivors. When you get to New York, there's going to be the largest, probably the largest delegation of A-bomb survivors to come to the United States ever, about 100. Uh, and given their average age of 78, you should appreciate on the one hand the kind of spirit that leads them to travel so far with, with uh, many of them having infirmities, uh, and also to appreciate this is probably the last time uh, that such a group will ever be able to come together. Um, the images are horrible. Um, uh, you have devastation uh, that was uh, didn't quit. The, after the first day or two, uh, people began to get these purple spots, uh, you know, vomiting, all kinds of horrible things. Uh, I, my book over here, Empire and the Bomb, has a chapter uh, in which which it goes into into considerable and I'm sorry to say unpleasant detail. Um, don't want to spend too much time in Hiroshima. I want to show this picture here. This is a statue which is right across from the Peace Park in Hiroshima. Uh, after the, the United States didn't want the rest of the world to know what had happened. Actually, Stimson had told Truman uh, that with the fire bombings and with the uh, anticipated uh, atomic bombing, uh, we were in danger of, of getting the reputation of, of, ba of basically competing with Hitler uh, in atrocities. Uh, so said our Secretary of War uh, to our President. Uh, after the atomic bombing and during the occupation, uh, it was not permitted for uh, Japanese scientists, doctors, teachers uh, to hold meetings to try to figure out what had happened. Uh, newspapers were forbidden to even have the Japanese characters uh, for the words atomic and bomb. Uh, this is a memorial to, uh, to children in a school. The school was essentially... Um, uh, incinerated, uh, evaporated. And you see the, the mushroom cloud. You're looking at, at uh, uh, essentially incinerated bodies, the, the neighborhood, um, everything uh, up into that mushroom cloud. Uh, but because of the censorship, they wanted to, they wanted to have a they wanted to have a memorial to these children. But because of censorship, uh, they could not indicate what the memorial was to. Uh, and so the E equals M C squared that you see here is code. Uh, under the occupation so that they could signal uh, what it was that had actually happened. Um, you know, today there's a very vital uh, Japanese peace movement. This is a photograph from the evening of August 6th after the official ceremonies when there are many, many thousands of people who have come to Hiroshima uh, to commemorate and to um, uh, build movement for, for the future. Uh, there will be more than 2,000 people coming from Japan uh, to New York uh, for both the International Peace Conference that will be held and for the rally and march uh, on May the 2nd. Uh, unfortunately, that's not where the unhappy history ends. Uh, the United States uh, was the sole, you know, we hear so much about deterrence. Our policy has always been deterrence. If you listen to every president speak, we have our nuclear weapons only for deterrence. Uh, but in fact, the first time the United States prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war after uh, Nagasaki, uh, was in 1946, uh, before the Soviets had the bomb, uh, when they were slow to uh, withdraw from a, a section of uh, uh, northern Iran, which they had occupied with our permission uh, when we were allies during the Second World War to help get supplies into, into Russia. Um, they weren't leaving. Uh, Truman called the um, uh, Soviet ambassador into the White House, uh, told him that if the withdrawal uh, from uh, uh, that portion of Iran did not begin within 48 hours, <coughs> Moscow would cease to exist. Uh, the withdrawal began in 24 hours. Uh, if you look at the history, and, and uh, much of it has been kept secret from us, although you can, can find it, uh, since Nagasaki, the United States has prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war on more than 40 occasions. Um, in the Middle East, I'll just run through the list, uh, 1946, uh, 1956 during the Suez Crisis, uh, 1958 uh, during the uh, first spasms of the Lebanese Civil War and the uh, coup in Iraq, uh, 1967 during the Six-Day War, uh, 1972 during Black September, 1973 during the um, October War uh, with the Carter Doctrine in 1980 uh, in the uh, run-up to the um, uh, 1991 uh, Gulf War, 
uh, in relationship to Iraq and uh, uh, Libya by President Clinton uh, in 1998 uh, and in the run-up to the most recent invasion of, uh, uh, of uh, Iraq. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, I'm sorry, in East Asia, the threats at least nine times against North Korea, uh, which should lead us not to be surprised that North Korea wants to get an atomic bomb uh, against China, against Russia. It's a, a long and unhappy history that most of us are unaware of, uh, but most of the rest of the world is. Uh, and it's uh, one reason why the rest of the world uh, is pressing for uh, the abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, we've come very close to um, those buttons being pushed, closer than we've known on a number of occasions. Uh, and uh, while the threat of a thermonuclear exchange between the United States and Russia at this point is greatly diminished, uh, the possibility of a more limited uh, nuclear war uh, still remains. So the question, what about other countries? Have other countries made, made nuclear threats? Uh, the Russians have, uh, the Soviets made one in 1956 against uh, Europe, which they probably could not have uh, implemented. Uh, Israel, during the 1973 war, uh, threatened to use the, its temple weapons. Uh, this was a threat made less against Egypt or Syria, more against the United States. Uh, the idea is that they, the United States was withholding um, uh, uh, weapons parts and new weapons, uh, in a sense to try to engineer the outcome of that war. Uh, Golda Meir communicated a threat in order to open up that, uh, that flow of weapons, um, and, and it worked. The idea was that, that the Israeli weapon would have been used against uh, the Russians, uh, which would have led to a general war, and that's how you blackmail another country. India and Pakistan made their threats in 19, during the 1999 Cargill War, and this is something that we have to be, I think, really quite, quite concerned about. Uh, uh, you know, were they to go to war again, we would face the possibility of a nuclear exchange. Uh, were uh, just 50 bombs used in, uh, in, in such a war, not only would it devastate uh, South Asia, uh, but the fallout uh, would result in uh, the first kind of stages of nuclear winter, uh, kind of global cooling, uh, which would mean uh, a vast uh, famine. Uh, estimates are that about a billion people around the planet uh, would die as a result of, um, uh, of an Indian-Pakistan nuclear exchange. Uh, France recently made threats against uh, Iran, uh, should they uh, act out a little bit. And Britain, believe it or not, uh, made a threat during the uh, Falklands War. Uh, the war against Argentina. Uh, uh, so these things are used uh, rather more than uh, one would hope. Uh, the Chinese uh, made, uh, again, a, a, a verbal threat uh, to, to communicate uh, seriousness uh, in a crisis. I want to get my year right. I think it was 1996 uh, uh, when there was a confrontation over uh, Taiwan, uh, and they sent a signal to the United States that uh, they thought that Los Angeles was more important to the United States than Taiwan. Uh, the Clinton administration responded by sending two nuclear-capable aircraft carriers through the tai Taiwan Strait, uh, which uh, very much uh, frightened uh, the Chinese. So this is, this is what we have um, in terms of some of the background. Uh, now, what's coming up, and the reason many people are going to New York, is that um, uh, beginning in, uh, on May 3rd, uh, there's a thing called the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference. It sounds very abstract, right? Um, it's an occasion when uh, all the signatories of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty come together uh, to uh, hold one another accountable to the commitments that they've made. Uh, most people in this country have no idea of what's in that treaty. Uh, they have an idea of one of the three legs, but let me tell you the three legs of that treaty. Uh, to my mind, it's one of the three most important agreements uh, of the 20th century. Uh, on the one hand, the non-nuclear nations, with the exceptions of Israel, India and Pakistan uh, committed that they would never become nuclear powers. Uh, in exchange, the nuclear powers uh, made two concessions. Uh, one was that the non-nuclear nations uh, could develop, have resources for nuclear power generation for peaceful purposes. Uh, that was certainly a fault in the, uh, in the treaty and opens up a lot of problems. Uh, and the second, in Article 6, you rarely read about this in the newspapers, uh, was that the nuclear powers committed to engage in good faith negotiations to completely eliminate their arsenals. So uh, when we come to these review conferences that take place every five years, on the one hand, many nations want to uh, make a more stringent inspection regime 
uh, for the non-nuclear powers to help ensure that they don't break out of the NPT order. And the biggest fear uh, that the United States and a number of countries have right now is in relationship to Iran. Uh, but most of the rest of the world is demanding that the nuclear powers finally fulfill their artist Article 6 uh, commitments. It's been 40 years. Uh, and what you see is the sense, and even Mohammed uh, Baraday, the former head of IEA, IAEA, uh, was quite clear, you've got hypocrisy going on here. Uh, the idea that we have them, you don't. We make demands of you, but you can't demand anything of us. Um, some years ago, I, I live and work up in the Boston area. Um, somehow I got invited to come to a thing at MIT where John Deutsch was speaking. He was number three in the Pentagon in the first part of the first Clinton administration and then became the head of the CIA. And I asked him, I didn't realize this was on C-SPAN at the time, I asked him, when is the United States going to fulfill, you know, fulfill its commitments under Article 6? And his response was, the United States never intended, nor does it intend now, to fulfill Article 6. That's just something you have to say to get what you want out of a conference. Uh, and this, is, you know, this has been uh, the attitude, and the rest of the world knows this. So between this kind of uh, uh, hypocrisy and the history of nuclear threats, you have powerful forces built into global systems uh, pressing for proliferation, especially when you're dealing here with technology uh, that's 65 years old. Uh, you know, as, as uh, one, one engineer told me, you know, any, any uh, physicist, uh, PhD graduating now, should be able to design a, a nuclear weapon. So the question is how do we, how do we limit that? Okay, so then this takes me into uh, looking at the uh, Obama uh, policies and, and where we are with that. Um, let me say that during the primary campaign, AFSC has a program in New Hampshire, and we hounded the, in, in, in the primary season, basically uh, a year and a half to basically two years before the um, presidential election, uh, you have uh, a swarm of, 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 of presidential candidates uh, in New Hampshire. So you can't walk down Main Street in Concord uh, without meeting a bunch of them. Uh, and we had trained people to, to ask them, you know, find them and ask them questions. Uh, so when Hillary Clinton launched her campaign at uh, Concord High School, as she's on her way out the door, a young woman asks, uh, will you oppose funding for a new nuclear weapon? Well, I don't know. I think, you know. Will, you, will, you support, uh, will, will you support implementation of Article 6? She turns on her heels and walks away. Uh, but the next day there is a, um, uh, next day there's a uh, op-ed uh, in the Manchester Union Leader describing just what happened. Uh, Barack Obama goes into a deli and is asked, will you, support, will you fulfill Article 6? Article what? Uh, but, you know, before the campaign is over, Obama and Edwards and Richardson are all saying they're committed to the abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, they're all saying that, that they'll work for its implementation of, of Article 6. Now, this does not come entirely from altruism. Um, the... Um, Many of us think that the Iraq War or Afghanistan were the greatest strategic blunders uh, of the Bush administration. I mean, they were terrible blunders. They've cost our society uh, dearly. Uh, but more so was its undercutting of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. This, you will remember, was an administration that had no respect whatsoever for treaties. Uh, one writer in the New York Times described that administration like, properly as having a romance with ruthlessness. Uh, the, this, this worship of, of military power, uh, the belief that they could simply dominate and impose reality. One, one of their spokesmen uh, says, look, we're an empire now. Uh, we, we, we create reality, uh, and you can report on it. Uh, so when you came in the approach to the 2005 uh, MPT review conference, uh, usually a year in advance, the, at least a year in advance, the agenda is agreed. Uh, the Bush administration refused to agree to an agenda. Halfway through the conference itself, the Bush administration refused to agree to an agenda. Finally, a little bit, a little bit more than halfway through, they agreed to an agenda. You have another two weeks of, of diplomacy. Uh, the uh, uh, conference collapses in failure. There's no agreement. Uh, and what you have is the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty order uh, in, in, in considerable jeopardy. Uh, the idea that, we, that, that, that with the U.S. refusing to move on, on uh, implementing uh, any part of Article 6 or agreeing to move forward in any way on disarmament, uh, why should other countries, the, the danger of greater proliferation. 
Uh, so in response to this, you have uh, George Shultz, the former Secretary of State, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, who himself had prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war at least twice, uh, William Perry, uh, uh, Clinton's uh, Secretary of Defense, and Sam Nunn, uh, the former Democratic Senator, uh, writing uh, then two articles in the Wall Street Journal. And if you read them carefully, uh, what you see is they are warning about the danger of proliferation. Uh, they say we have to make serious uh, reductions in our arsenal, and we have to reaffirm our commitment to Article 6 in order to regain traction within the nonproliferation process. And if you read Obama's speeches, if you read the Nuclear Posture Review, what you see over and over again is even as he's called for the abolition of nuclear weapons, but you know, perhaps not in my young lifetime, uh, it's always about nonproliferation. Uh, it's about trying to maintain uh, the order. And clearly we don't want nonproliferation, we don't want proliferation, uh, but the reality is that we're not going to get it unless we take much more serious actions on, on our part. So let me do then a little bit of deconstruction uh, of, uh, of, of the events of the last uh, uh, several weeks uh, to remind ourselves that it's not an accident that we had the signing of New START, uh, that we had the release of the Nuclear Posture Review, and we had the um, uh, Nuclear Security Summit uh, all in essentially a month uh, before the Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference. This is about developing some momentum, trying to gain traction uh, for the United States in terms of nonproliferation within uh, next month's uh, conference. And because it's not really ultimately about abolition, that's why you and so many people from around the world are going to, uh, going to, to New York. Uh, many governments are going to New York with, with, with that, that deep commitment. And in fact, the Secretary General of the United Nations, this, uh, I don't know if this is widely known yet, has agreed to speak at our conference on May the 1st uh, in his call, that the, uh, which he shares with us, uh, that that uh, NPT review conference uh, should uh, conclude with a commitment to begin those good faith negotiations <coughs> uh, under Article 6. So let me then do some quick deconstruction. Uh, the New START Treaty. Uh, negotiated uh, with Russia. The old START treaty uh, expired. Um, the uh, spin on it is that this will uh, reduce the U.S. and um, uh, Soviet arsenals by, depending on which article you read, uh, by a third, uh, or it will d to reduce our deployed arsenals by a third. There's a difference uh, because it doesn't affect at all uh, uh, either our or the Soviet Union stockpiles on the order of about 7,000 each, uh, strategic weapons. Uh, averaging, again, 20 times the size of the, the Hiroshima uh, A-bomb. Um, uh, but it does call for the reduction of, um, uh, of, of their deployed arsenals uh, from two, roughly 2,200 uh, to 1,550. Uh, one Chinese blogger wrote, wrote this. He said, well, those countries have had the ability to um, uh, destroy the world 50 times over. Uh, with these reductions, they can destroy it 49 times over. Um, and you know, while it's a, it's a helpful step, uh, we should appreciate that seven years from now, when this is done, uh, the deployed arsenals will be the equivalent of 60,000 Hiroshimas. Uh, and as the Federation of Atomic Scientists tells us, uh, it will not change the nuclear structures uh, of either side. Uh, that said, it's important to win its, its ratification by the Senate as a way to further stabilize relations uh, with Russia. Uh, and to help to create a global environment uh, that values at least some limited uh, disarmament. I should also add just the counting is really pretty nasty. Uh, in arms control negotiations, one and one does not necessarily equal two, or two minus one doesn't necessarily equal one. Uh, so in the new counting, uh, a, a B-52 uh, bomber uh, armed, say, with, uh, with ten atomic bombs will be counted as one warhead. Uh, so the reductions from 2,200 to 1,500 uh, will not be really reductions of five, you know, of, of almost 600 bombs. It's, it's um, a little bit of sleight of hand. Okay, then we have the nuclear posture review. Uh, again, its value is that it uh, states quite clearly that we want to uh, reduce our dependence on uh, on uh, on nuclear weapons in our national security policy. Uh, it also says, and I quote. Uh, these weapons will continue to play an essential role in our policies. Um, there were reports in the New York Times, essentially, of a fairly pitched battle uh, between President Obama on the one hand, 
uh, and the Pentagon and his National Security Council on the other. Uh, reports are that he, perhaps uh, Vice President Biden, uh, wanted to move to no first strike policy. I mean, our policy, we told us deterrence is not deterrence. Or if you read deterrence, deterrence in Pentagon language means deterring other nations from taking actions uh, which we don't want them to take. Uh, not necessarily a deterrence of, of nuclear attack, which is how you explain uh, most of those 40 nuclear threats that we've made. Um, and drafts went back and forth, back and forth, uh, but at the end, uh, U.S. first strike policy uh, prevailed. Uh, about two weeks before that, China was clear in reiterating its, um, uh, uh, its rejection of first strike. Uh, the Soviets, or rather the Russians, maintained first strike in large measure out of fear of, of U.S. Uh, attack, uh, and also because we have a major conventional um, uh, overwhelming power. Uh, and to appreciate, you know, sometimes we want to we want to separate this all out, that there's nuclear weapons or there's Afghanistan or there's conventional weapons. Uh, but Mikhail Gorbachev, who probably, had he been able to stay in power, would have taken us much, much further in terms of nuclear disarmament, uh, he said about six months ago, uh, that we can't expect the uh, Russians to move toward complete elimination of nuclear weapons <clears throat> as long as we're monopolizing the militarization of space, expanding NATO around its borders. We've got to deal with conventional weapons as we attempt to, to uh, build down uh, in the competition with, with Russia. Um, the other elements that are there, uh, again, we're told that uh, on the one hand, we won't use nuclear weapons against states that, that comply with the NPT. Um, but none of the nuclear powers, including the United States, comply with the NPT. They're all out of compliance. So what does that really mean? Uh, we're told that we won't use uh, our nuclear weapons against uh, countries with <coughs> chemical and biological weapons. Um, but if it's necessary, we'll reconsider. Uh, so we didn't get very much there. Uh, so I'm afraid that in the end, as has been described in many places, the Nuclear Posture Review is essentially a status quo document. Then we come to last week's uh, nuclear uh, security summit. Again, you know, after the Prague speech, uh, we had high mm -hmm. hopes for abolition. We didn't know quite what this conference was going to be, uh, but as we know, it's about locking down uh, loose fissile material. It's important to lock down loose fissile material. I mean, the number one security priority uh, of the United States since uh, about 2000 and one, about November 11th, 2001, has been to ensure that uh, we are not attacked either by non-state uh, 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 terrorists or, or actors with nuclear weapons uh, or as a result of uh, proliferation. Uh, and a key element to this is locking down fissile material. This is material um, in, in nuclear power plants. This is, uh, weapon, this is material in the um, uh, stockpiles of countries. Uh, a lot has been uh, locked down in Russia since uh, uh, 1989, but there's still more to do. Uh, we've got problems. We worry about what's happening in Pakistan. Uh, and there's concerns about industrial um, uh, radioactive materials, the, um, you know, the, the possibility that one can get materials coming out of uh, hospitals, for example, um, uh, uh, factories that use low-level uh, radioactive materials. Uh, the fear is that uh, such could be, for example, put, a, put around a uh, couple sticks of dynamite uh, put in, um, in Wall Street. Uh, and then you wouldn't have what we consider a, a, a nuclear explosion, but there would be sufficient radioactivity in the neighborhood uh, that people might not want to come to Wall Street, and that would have serious impacts uh, on, on our economy and the global economy. So we're, one more piece to hit in terms of, of uh, Obama policy. Uh, is unfortunately uh, his national budget. Uh, so here we are in a situation where uh, in state after state, uh, people are losing essential jobs, uh, essential services. Uh, we know that the motor force of the American economy is our educational system, uh, and yet we face cuts there. People are still having foreclosures. Uh, but there's going to be $2 billion more to expand the uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, production infrastructure. Uh, there is $800 million in there to develop a new nuclear capable uh, uh, cruise missile. Uh, and there's uh, more money uh, to study the uh, uh, development of a new nuclear weapon, which the Nuclear Posture Review says we're not going to build. So, you know, it's, it's uh, mixed messages, uh, probably the result of intense uh, battles uh, and a uh, horse uh, drawn by a committee. So then let me um, conclude 
uh, by saying a little bit about uh, what's going to happen in New York, who's going to be there, uh, what's it about. Uh, again, the uh, reality is that um, uh, major policy changes uh, come from below, uh, whether it's the uh, end of Jim Crow, uh, whether it's the free <coughs> movement, whether it's the women's movement, um, it comes from below. Um, change happens structurally and happens by, by people's action. Um, governments will come and, you know, the reality, again, something most of us don't know is that every year the General Assembly uh, votes something like about 183 to 3 with a couple of extensions that the uh, uh, nuclear power should begin those negotiations. Costa Rica, uh, Malaysia, uh, other countries have introduced basically draft treaties. So it's not like it's something abstract and impossible. Uh, there's an NGO uh, draft treaty developed by um, uh, scientists, engineers, uh, and former government officials that lays out the roadmap of how step-by-step step, uh, nuclear weapons would be abolished. Uh, the uh, mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, having launched an organization called Mayors for Peace, uh, have a plan for the abolition of all nuclear weapons uh, by the year 2020. Uh, there's another uh, somewhat elite organization called Global Zero, which has a somewhat longer uh, timeline uh, of eliminating them by, by 2030. It's not a, not a dream. Uh, last year, uh, uh, when there was the preparatory uh, uh, conference held at the UN, uh, again, people from, the, uh, people from popular movements and NGOs from around the world uh, came together to talk about you know, what's happening, analyze what's happening uh, within the, uh, the, the governmental discussions, but also to plan where we're going from, from here. Uh, out of that came the creation of this thing with this god-awful name uh, called the 2010 uh, NPT Review uh, uh, International Planning Committee. It's not sexy, but it describes what we are. Uh, so this is a, a core group of about 25 organizations um, from the United States, from Japan, uh, from Europe, uh, who've been planning a, a series of events uh, to, on the one hand, uh, help people here in this country understand the seminal importance of what takes place in New York next month, uh, to help give um, uh, some diplomats, uh, some backbone, uh, and uh, also in being together to be developing uh, plans and strategies uh, for the longer term. Uh, I should add that we're also clear that uh, the nuclear disarmament movement can't do it by itself. Uh, there's a recognition that uh, 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 the dangers of nuclear weapons are clearly interlocked, uh, uh, integrated uh, with other questions of war and peace, economic justice, uh, and environmental uh, sustainability. So our, our, our call relates uh, around all four, and our plans uh, move in that, that direction. Uh, we <coughs> issued a call. It can be found at the website, which is down here, www.peaceandjusticenow.org. Uh, we issued a, a call. Uh, it's now been signed by something like 310 organizations worldwide. And one of the challenges for us on the other side of all this is going to be to see what we do uh, with this uh, incipient um, uh, uh, structure. Um, we agreed essentially to do four things. Uh, one is to hold an international uh, uh, peace conference, abolition conference, which will be held at uh, Riverside Church in New York, um, the site of Martin Luther King's uh, 1967 a Declaration of Independence uh, from the War in Vietnam, which is actually a Declaration of Independence from Militarism. And we'll be rooting uh, elements of what we do uh, in that speech and in that, that history. Uh, we have, unfortunately, limited capacity, and we're about, we're about full. Uh, we'll have about 200 people from Japan, maybe 200 from Europe, uh, maybe about 400 in our principal prime, uh, plenaries. We have an amazing uh, list of speakers, which you can find uh, on the uh, on, on the web page. Um, and that's the conference that will be addressed by Ban Ki-moon, I mean, not particularly because he loves us, uh, but because it's a way in which he can signal to the world that the kind of work that you're doing, uh, popular work from below, is what is essential. We can't just wait for governments to give it to us. We have to go out and use our people's power to make governments do what they're supposed to do. Uh, we agreed to hold a uh, international, uh, international Day of Action for a Nuclear Weapons Free Future. Uh, this will be a march beginning by Times Square, uh, going across 42nd Street, uh, concluding uh, across from the United Nations, where we'll be holding a festival. Uh, among the speakers there, and also at our conference, uh, will be the mayor of Hiroshima, 
And at the rally, we'll also have the mayor of Nagasaki. We have people coming from uh, Russia, uh, environmentalists from, from Russia, uh, peace activists from Brazil. It's, it's going to be really quite, quite something. Uh, we also agreed to uh, deliver petitions uh, to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the MPT review conference. Um, we expect something like 12 million, 14 million signatures from Japan. Uh, about a month and a half ago, one organization sent 5.4 million over by, by uh, boat. Uh, we'll be displaying them uh, on May the 2nd, uh, and we'll do a, a um, uh, kind of informal presentation on the grounds of the UN. Uh, on uh, May the 4th, uh, a number of organizations that have uh, uh, countries that have developed different petitions uh, will be doing a formal presentation uh, at the conclusion of business uh, within the MPT conference itself. Uh, but, you know, the reality is that um, uh, people with uh, hair the color of mine, um, bones uh, the quality of mine, um, we, we, can, we can make important contributions. Uh, but the reality is that uh, a lot of change comes from young people, uh, and uh, young people are going to be this movement uh, for the longer term. Uh, so one of the commitments that we early made was to do what we could to support uh, and facilitate uh, organizing done by, by young people uh, on those days and then throughout the MPT review. And it's just been this really wonderful network. You'll hear more about it uh, shortly. Uh, but young people from Germany, I think about uh, 400, uh, maybe 500 of the Japanese who are coming are you know, under 25. I uh, think outside the bomb here has played a, a major role. And there'll be a series of events and demonstrations uh, that they'll be holding throughout. Uh, and if you will, uh, building the foundations uh, for a militant and longer term uh, movement. Um, so that, that I guess is what I have to say. I guess the last thing I'm going to say is, is this. Uh, it's a story, uh, I'm gonna use the podium that I've got here and the, uh, the internet to tell a story that almost nobody knows. Uh, in 1980, uh, as the Reagan administration was uh, moving to, actually the Team B, uh, before Reagan came to power, uh, developing plans for the next major uh, escalation of the arms race, uh, a young man named uh, Randy Keeler and a few people out in western Massachusetts uh, who had been working against nuclear power, doing referendums on nuclear power, uh, organized referendums in three state Senate districts, and AFSC was involved in this, uh, calling for a freeze in the nuclear arms race. And even as Reagan won in those districts, people voted for a freeze. In 1980, 1980 um, the Service Committee was facing some uh, uh, budget cuts and some staff cuts. Uh, and our staff, we had a, a meeting in New England of our staff. And at one point, with a somewhat inappropriate segue, uh, our staff person from Vermont got up and said, in the town meeting votes that we have this coming spring, uh, people in 15 towns are going to vote for a nuclear weapons freeze. And next year, 175 towns in New Hampshire will vote for a nuclear weapons freeze. And, you know, to be honest, we all thought, Dave, that's a wonderful dream, uh, but we don't think it's going to happen, but give it a good shot. Uh, that spring, 17 towns voted for a nuclear weapons freeze. You had the first op-ed article uh, in the New York Times announcing uh, that this was coming. Uh, on the basis of this model, uh, the following year, 330 towns across New England and eight states uh, voted for a nuclear weapons freeze, forcing President Reagan to do what he swore he would never do, which was to negotiate uh, with uh, Soviet leaders. Uh, I tell this story uh, simply to, to remind us uh, that it is actions that we take from below. Often, often things that we don't expect will have results uh, that ultimately change history. And that freeze movement played a major role, an unsung role, uh, in uh, ending uh, the Cold War. Uh, so with that, uh, let me uh, celebrate uh, your, your work, uh, appreciate the speakers who will follow, who have uh, much more to say, and uh, to hope to see a number of you in New York, uh, and uh, to say we will prevail. <laughs>